everybody, welcome to another episode of We Run This. I am Chris Luminati and he is Nick Domingo. What's up, Nick? Hey, dude. Just living, man. Uh, I hear you. Oh, I'm, I'm living. I'm uh, catching my father before he falls down steps. It's been a great day. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Back up what? <laughs> so uh, right before we started recording. So, okay. So I have to admit a little bit of something that's going to make me sound like a giant man baby, but like... Uh, so I uh, live in an apartment complex and we have um, coin operated laundry. And it's not, it's not even like, it's, it's like in the next building over. So like, and it doesn't take debit cards or anything like that. So you always have to get change. And it's just a pain in the ass getting quarters. So sometimes when I go visit my parents, I'll like bring a load of towels over or whatever. And I'd be like, hey, you know, can I, and like, I, I never stick around long enough. My mom's like, just go and I'll do them. And then we'll like, you can come pick them up or whatever. So they were on my side of town and they decided to drop them off. And my dad has had carpal tunnel surgery on his left hand. He needs to do it on his right hand. And he's got like a bad shoulder. I mean, my dad's 76 years old. The problem is he's stubborn as shit and thinks he's like 40. So uh, he always feels like he has to do things for himself. So they came over to drop them off today. And my mom's like, your dad's coming upstairs to just bring the laundry, like open the front door for him. So I'm opening the front door and he's coming up steps and he's carrying this big like laundry basket. He gets to the last step. He trips with this giant laundry basket, falls forward like past me and right past my door is a brick wall. And he just kind of like runs head first into the brick wall and down on his feet. Now, the good thing is the laundry basket was big enough that it kind of like took the brunt of, yeah, the, caught him. Yes, of the brick wall but he did kind of like scratch up his head. And the first thing he says is like, don't tell your mom. While he's got blood like flying down yeah. his face. I'm like, you're going to get in the car. She's going to see blood. So he's inside here. He's like cleaning up his head with peroxide. Uh, I'm like, you got to tell her. He's like, I'll tell her that my shoe was untied. I'm like, I don't see how that's any better than telling her the real reason that you just like tripped I mean, but the, the moral of my story is uh, sometimes, especially when you get older, we do a ton of things that we think we still have the ability to do when we really don't. And sometimes we should just go, you know what? I don't have the ability to do this anymore. I'm going to let somebody. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, whether it's uh, carrying a load of laundry for your son or, uh, you know, going to run, for instance, and thinking I can be Superman and, and go run. 20 miles tomorrow because, hey, I used to be able to do that when I was 22 after a night of partying. I can be able to do it at 35, 36, 40, whatever it is. You know, our bodies tend to break down as we get old. I'm just glad your dad is okay, right? He's fine. I, I texted my mom. She said he's okay. I kept on asking him questions. I was afraid of like a concussion or something. Yeah. So I kept on asking. And then while he was here, he asked me in a span of five minutes how my kids were doing. He asked me twice and I was like, oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> like, he was like, the same exactly. question. Yeah, but then My again. Dad is totally boomer. He is officially gone boomer territory now. <laughs> the, 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 the fall knocked it into him. Yeah, and like, I'm just like, oh God. So I'm worried about that. But the whole like point of that story was just, I mean, look, us going out and running 20 miles when we can't anymore, that's a little bit different than like picking up laundry, like, but I guess we should all know our limitations and kind of like back off. It's, it's probably harder to admit that you can't ca carry laundry up the steps anymore. Yeah, that's true. It seems like a simple task that, uh, you know, most most people, not to say that your dad's old, but older people than you and, you and I mm -hmm. might not want to admit, you know, my grandma, I told you, you know, stories about her in the past with Christmas you know, we were there last year and she did something similar where it's like, you're 96, 97 years old. You have to have railings in your bathroom so you don't fall. Pretty natural, right? We don't want you to fall. We don't want you to slip. She put her foot down and was like, absolutely not. Like, we're not doing that. I don't care. You know, I've got it. And it's like, you know, it seems like one of those simple tasks. Like, I'm just going to shower by myself or brush my teeth by myself. They're not willing to give up that freedom. So... It's gonna happen to you and me, man. Sadly. Yeah, yeah Sadly. probably probably to me in like the next year or two. <laughs> I think I'm there. I feel like I'm already there. I don't know what's going on, man. There's always something. 
<laughs> are you gonna are you gonna spend the weekend putting up uh railings in your shower yes i fucking need to man trust me i like i'm slipping and sliding all over the place my, my knees are cranky i don't know what's happening i don't know i'll tell you what i don't want a railing in my shower but i'll take one of those seats yeah hell yeah but, like where you sit down in the shower like i want one of those you just sit there and just relax man it's like you're in a spa <laughs> Yeah, but they always put them on the far wall. Like I want it in the middle, like a bar stool, almost. Yeah. Like, like so they I can just, the, sh- <laughs> the water just pours on you. Don't have to do anything. Yeah, and then it spins so you can kind of hit your back. Yeah. Yeah. Man, just, you're on something. Yeah. A you spinning, are on something right a now. Spinning <laughs> bar stool shower shower stool a spinning shower stool. Dude, I'm 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 full of great ideas today. I don't know what it is. Re- Retails for sixty nine ninety nine. You just roll around, spin around in that shower. You you lit, and and maybe you have the soap like dispense from mm-hmm. the shower head, so it's already turned into soap, and it just like hits you, turns off. You have a two second shower. Yeah. Dude, you're saving you're saving the planet too. Dude, I'm uh. Let's let's just go. Make, I might I might go make a prototype in my shower right now. A little, yeah. a, little a little like koozie for beer, like a little like cup holder. I mean, this this is a phenomenal idea. I'm this not is, kidding. When I, I'm not, I am in full support of this idea right This now. is revolutionary. I can't believe this is right. going to be how I make my billions. Exactly, right? But before I make my billions, <laughs> we have a guest. <laughs> Here we go. This is a hell of a segue. It hell is. of a segue. I can't wait till she hears this and realizes we went from shower stool to Gab Bolin, uh, runner, instructor, ultra marathoner, marathoner. Uh, she does... I don't want to say she's a nutritionist, but she uh, she talks nutrition a lot. She's vegan. She's an all around cool girl, and uh, we had a great conversation with her. Absolutely, no, she's she's totally rad. Loved her energy, um, and and really her advice on on what what to do in the process of training. And for you and I, obviously, with uh, the new year and a lot of people listening, the new year, uh, some resolutions on how to clean up your life in terms of eating and, and fitness, getting that inspiration to, to be able to do that. So um, yeah, Gab Bolin, she's, she, she brought the energy for sure. And uh, looking forward to you guys listening to, to hear what she has to say. Yeah, she was a great interview. Not so good at personal branding. <laughs> yeah, not, not Garb- really a lot of garbage, a <laughs> lot of garbage. Not really that good, but we'll let you guys listen to that. Here's uh, Gab Bolin. <laughs> So everybody, we are back. It's me, Nick, and we are with Gab Bolin. Gab, how are you? I'm great. How are you guys? Doing good, doing good. You look very like cheery today. Wow. Um, that is a really, really um very welcoming intro. I look cheery. I will take it. Um, I would say I'm probably like a six out of ten on the cheer scale. Okay. Or do you know what you're because it looks like a nine out of ten. Wow. I uh, can you guys can we talk every day? Like, can this be regular? Um, because that's awesome. Thank you. Totally. How about we just we just zoom you every morning and we just talk you up for a good 10 minutes? I then... think my entire life would improve, honestly. Well, you know what? Actually, let's let's start right there because part of your I mean, you have you wear many different hats and we're gonna get into all of them, but one of them is that you work with studio and yeah. you're you you train online with people. So basically you, you got to be, and even as a trainer with anything, you got to be on, like yes. you got to be cheery and jumpy. So what do you do on those days when you just don't feel like being cheery and jumpy? So I feel like the, the right answer is to be like, you know, I really think about the reason why I do it and all the people that I'm inspiring. But the truth is like Red Bull, sugar-free Red Bull is a game changer. Um, just to like get, you know, the blood flowing, I guess. But um you know, besides the caffeine addiction that I have that completely controls my entire existence, um, I think it, it's really just something that happens when the red light on the camera goes on and you're like, holy shit, this is happening. Like, I'm in it. And then, you know, you kind of get lost in the doing rather than the how it makes you feel, which is kind of similar to like, you know, when you wake up on marathon day and you're like, the last thing I want to do right now is run a race. But when, you know, you start moving and things start happening, it kind of brings you back to that, like, this is actually really cool. I'm glad I'm here. I love how you get your adrenaline from Red Bull, but then like 
that red light goes on, you're like, I actually don't fucking need anything. I could have just done this all on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Basically it's like, it's like the preparation to get on the stage and then the rest is kind of just like, you know, the, the magic of being involved in something like that. So part of that is obviously you're not in a studio with people, right? Like you're doing it virtually. And I've always wondered, we've asked a few other people who, who do something similar. Where do you get the inspiration throughout a class? Like, you know, I think for all three of us, we could probably admit we can push ourselves while we're running, while we're cycling, we kind of know what we're doing. But on the other end of it, you don't know who's watching you. You don't necessarily know who, you know, has it and who doesn't that day. So yeah. how do you maintain that energy to be like, I owe it to these people to like push them day in and day out? So I think that I have enough experience as a group fitness instructor and a personal trainer in like a live setting to kind of be able to recall what an average class feels like or what a, you know, what a, what this moment feels like when there are people there. And I'm able to kind of put myself back in that position and be like, what do they need for me right now? Whereas maybe if I didn't have that experience, it would be a little bit more challenging to imagine what that would feel like. Um, but also I, I think that when I program my classes, I'm thinking a little bit like, okay, this moment is going to be tough for 75% of the participants. So that's the moment where I'm going to need to a give modifications and then b like really give them the motivation to push through. I know it's tough. I know you want to quit, but here's what's going to happen if you push through. Um, so it's a little bit of like recalling how it feels to be in a room with people, which is like the most 2020 thing I've ever said or 2021 thing I've ever said. Um, you know, remembering what it feels like to be around people, but it's also, I think just knowing your program and knowing when people are going to need that little extra push. You know, I was thinking about this before we jumped on the, on the show. Um, so you do the studio thing and, and we've seen a lot of different things come out where it's working out at home. Do they do any type of like analytics that show when people use it the most or like when the heaviest times is? Because I was wondering in a day like yesterday, now when people listen to this, it's going to be a little bit past it. So Yesterday was the whole incident at the, you know, it's called the insurrection or whatever happened, you know, at the Capitol. Do you find that in moments like that, the workouts jump because people are like, okay, uh, I'm about to freak out. I need to do something besides watch the news. So I'm going to work out for an hour and look at a screen different than CNN. Like, do, yeah. they, do they study things like that? So I'm sure that they do. Like we have a whole team that does the analytics and the programming and all that like background stuff, background backdoor stuff, I guess. Um, I honestly don't know off the top of my head what all of that looks like. Um, they kind of keep the talent away from that stuff. But I can tell you that I get tagged on Instagram and on Facebook and you know people talking about doing my workouts. And there's definitely a jump um, when there are things like that that happen that really evoke people's emotions and they feel like they need an outlet. Um, it happens a lot around the holidays. It happens a lot around um, you know, the election and just things like that. I was just going to ask, how many times did you get tagged during the election? Like for an entire oh week? My God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because everybody just needs an outlet. And I think that there are a lot of different types of instructors and instructors that cater to people's, uh, you know, different needs. And I'm a very like, no bullshit. We are going to go hard. Like, I, I don't want to hear about you're tired or you're upset or this or that. Like, you hit play, we're going to go. And so I think people gravitate toward that when there's so much going on in the background and they kind of just want to come into like a, like a clear headspace. So you said something that I, I love and it's that you go like hard, balls to the wall, like no bullshit. And obviously I'm not at your level, but I, I years ago taught spin. Mm -hmm. And my buddy would come into my class and they were like, I fucking hate going to your class because you punish us for what you did. They were like, mm -hmm. I know that over the weekend you had like an entire pizza and down, you know, two cases of beer. And in my head, I'm like, I got to work that off in this hour that I'm teaching. So I'm like punishing them. Do you do something similar where like if you have cheat days or like coming out of the holidays, you're like, I kind of feel gross or soft. I'm going to push these guys for like my decision. Yes. Yeah. And I probably never admit that again, but it's true because I think like, especially when there's no one in the room, you're not feeding off of the energy that people are giving you. You are creating the energy and then also feeding off of it. So it's like, 
if I, if I have anything going on in my life that I can draw from, I'm going to. And if sometimes that's like, I need a damn good workout, then that's what we're doing. Like, we're going to go hard. Um, I think a lot of instructors, even like in a one on, you know, in a, in an actual group setting versus digitally, they don't always do the workout along with the participants because it's, it's really challenging to talk and to be, you know, present and mindful while the workout is going on. But like, I do the whole thing and I'm, I'm able to be present and to be mindful when it's happening but like it's a good workout and I want it too you know so like if if we're going hard like I'm going hard too so for sure so we were I was reading your background both of us were maybe I don't know Nick can you read (laughs) no I'm dyslexic I'm sorry I make fun of Nick at least one time an episode and that was it I love it (laughs) so um little brother big brother that's how that's our relationship yeah I you know Um, what you could have dug me there and said older brother and it would have been funny (laughs) (laughs) that's true (laughs) but so uh we're looking over your bio and it said that you used to be an actress Mm -hmm. uh, but then you kind of got out of it to do health and fitness so let's talk about when you were an actress and how did that kind of train you for what you're doing now Yeah. So I actually have a BFA in performing arts and I joke with my friends that are like, you know, in marketing or in like all these other, you know, real fields um, that I use my degree more every single day than anyone else that I know. Um, I... I was an actor essentially from the time that I was old enough to ask my parents to put me in plays like local community theater. I just loved it. I think because I grew up an only child, I had a wild imagination because I, it was, it wasn't all the time that I had somebody else to play with. So I did a lot of like, you know, playing with my toys and kind of by myself. And I just, I created this incredible, um, you know, set of imaginary circumstances that I kind of lived in all the time. And so when it came down to like, you know, being in community theater and people saying like, well, you're, you know, eight or nine, can you, can you really make this seem like it's happening? And I was like, I got you. Like I, you know, that's my specialty. So I acted pretty much all through growing up. Once I got into high school, I started winning some awards for it. Um, And that was when my parents were like, all right, you can, you can pursue this. Like, this is legitimate. You may have something here. So I went to school for acting And I went to Marymount Manhattan College, which is a very small performing arts school because that school allows you to audition and actually work while you're in the program. So I started going on auditions for television shows with being on the camera. I did SVU, I did CSI New York on the one day that they actually film in New York. Um, I did a pilot for MTV. I don't know if you remember College Humor, which was like a humongous site back in the day. I did something for them that went viral. It was on Conan. Um, I was then it? I got a, it was called the Hunger Games game. It was like a, like a board game based on the Hunger Games. Okay, wow. It was, it was cute. Um, and then eventually I got a, a pretty permanent position on the TV show Gossip Girl, um, which is kind of a funny story. They, uh, they have a, a pretty big background cast. And so for a little while, I was like a reoccurring background role in the school. And then when they had Michelle Trachtenberg come back, because that show is very wardrobe heavy, if they're doing a one-on-one conversation, they'll do an over-the-shoulder shot. But they'll get all of one person, and then they'll have a body double come in to be like the back of their head. That way the actual actor can go and like get into the next costume and get their hair done and their makeup done and all that stuff so I was actually Michelle Trachtenberg's body double which is it sounds kind of lame and like not really acting but I had to read the lines with all of the other actors so I actually acted with the real cast you just never heard me or saw me from the front um so it was a pretty interesting role but for being like 1920 and earning that kind of money and being in school and living in New York City like on your own it was awesome So I, that was a really great gig. And then when the show got canceled, I was auditioning for things and I was like, you know, just trying to get my next job and what was I gonna do? And I just found myself in this place where I was like, so focused on, am I thin enough? Am I pretty enough? And it, I wasn't even really like, I would, my agent would send me sides to rehearse for an audition and I wouldn't even look at them because I would just be so focused on how do I, how do I fit into this dress? How do I make sure that like my makeup looks good? How do I, and it just, it was so toxic that one day I woke up and I was like, I don't like this anymore. I don't like who I am. I don't like my priorities. And I was like, I just need to step back and take a break. 
And so one day I was like, I wonder what would happen if I went to the gym and I was like interested in how it made me feel instead of whether or not I burned enough calories. And I kind of got involved in like, you know, I had, I had only ever been like a, an elliptical kind of girl. And I remember getting on the treadmill for the first time and being like, all right, I kind of see why people like this. And I just got more and more into it. And before I knew it, I was like, this is what I want to do. I don't want to go back to acting. I don't want to do that. This is more rewarding. I want to make people feel good instead of constantly competing with them to be like better and thinner and prettier and, you know, whatever. And um, when I found group fitness, I was like, I can do fitness and also be on the stage and everyone is looking at me like this is like, this is the perfect combination of my skill sets. And uh, I kind of never looked back. That's awesome. For, so, you know, you obviously got into the, the running thing when you made that switch from acting to go into fitness. At what point did you say, this is what I want to do as like a hobby? Not You, you kind of talked about how it made you feel and you weren't just doing it to, to burn the calories and all that good stuff. But really, it was like a mental, physical, whatever being it was. When did you decide this is going to be something I want to actually compete in and not just do, you know, three miles a day or when I, when I have time to go to the gym? So that actually took me kind of a long time. And it was because I had been a cycling instructor. So at this point, when I started to run a little bit more than like three miles at a time, it was a little bit more like, I want to see how far I can go. I was teaching two cycling classes at a gold's gym, one on Wednesday night and one on Thursday morning. And by Thursday night, my knees were so swollen. I could like barely walk. I was icing them. It was terrible. And my friend Robin, who had just run her first marathon was like, you should really get more into running with me. Like, I think you would really like it. And I was like, you know, I'm a cycling instructor, so I can't do both. Like I can't, like my body can't handle that. Like I only do cycling now. My friend was like, okay, well, what about people who do like Ironmans? Like, how about them? They, they do both. And so she kind of called me out on my bullshit. And I was like, all right, you know, whatever. So she actually is a, is a dietitian and she convinced me to give a plant-based diet a try for 30 days to see if it would help with my inflammation. And that was three and a half years ago. Um, I have never gone back. I've run 10 marathons, three ultra marathons. And uh, it was, it was absolutely insane how just like not eating like a fozel like helped me recover and, and I could run further and I didn't have all these health issues. Like it was, it was completely life-changing because I think I went from barely eating at all to just like eating whatever and then being like oh my body can't handle this kind of training volume like I wonder why um and so finding like a happy medium of not eating a ton of processed garbage and like being a little bit more mindful of fuel uh it completely changed the game for me and so once I could do I think probably like six or seven miles without absolutely needing to take like three days off from the rest of my life I was like if I can do six or seven like I wonder what would happen if I did 13.1 and then 26.2 and then I was like well why stop there right let's keep going so what order did they go in like did it go half uh then marathon then ultra then triathlon or did you did it kind of so technically speaking if we're talking about races it was half full triathlon ultra or maybe it was ultra triathlon um but prior to actually running my first half marathon i wanted to make sure that i could do it so i went out for a 16 mile run just to like make sure I would be okay uh, the week before the race. So it was a little, it was a little hairy. And then I did the same thing with a marathon where I was like, if I'm gonna get to the starting line of this, let me make sure. So I went for, you know, 26.2 on my own before the actual race. Um, call it, you know, being a real anxiety induced, you know, New Yorker. Um, so I, I definitely did it in like the, the traditional order of half, full and then i i want to say i did ultra before triathlon and what where do you get that that motivation from to do that i mean you know we, we've talked to some ultra runners before who kind of made that big leap chris and i admittedly are are talking about trying to do an ultra at some point this, we're this year close. we're this close yeah anyway. we're very very close i think i think yeah. we're both convinced like everyone who does ultras, they're like, do it, just do it. Like, of course you're going to say, do it. <laughs> like, yeah. We've never, if we ever have an ultra runner on, yeah, don't do it. Exactly. Like I'm waiting for the ultra runner to go, no, no. 
Stay the fuck away. Yeah. So, I mean, where do you where do you get that that inner motivation to push yourself to do it more? Um, especially like, I mean, that's pardon me judging you. I mean, it's fucked up that you were like, I'm gonna run the half marathon more than the half marathon before I run the actual race, and then do a marathon before the marathon to prove that I can do it. Like, where do you get that? Where does that come from? You think? So. I, at the, at the risk of sounding really cliche, I feel like I, from the very beginning of like my venture into athletics, because I was not an athletic kid in, I never played sports. Like no one in my family plays sports. I was a theater kid. Like the most I did was breaking a sweat, dancing, like doing a box step for a musical. Mm -hmm. I really was never into athletics. But once I started to dabble in it, I was like, I was in such a bad headspace with like being and acting and kind of having that whole like, I don't really know who I am. And like, I let other people kind of decide how I feel about myself on any given day. I, I kind of framed it in this, like, if I can run one more mile, I'm tired, but if I can go one more mile, I can do anything in my real life. Like nobody can make me feel like I'm not good enough because look at what I just did. And like, there's no one that's going to tell me that I am not brave or I am not strong or I'm not this, like I am all of those things. And so it was very intrinsically motivated by this idea that like, if I can do it, no one can take that away from me. That is a power that I get to keep for the rest of my life. And there will not be another person who can upset me without me allowing them to, because look at what I can do. And it just, it was like 13.1 was good, but I could do more. And then 26.2 was good, but I could do more. And I just wanted to continue to prove like I was good enough and I had everything that I needed without anybody else's bullshit. I love it. You like created a chip on your shoulder even though it was like not really there. Yeah. That's pretty unique to be able to do. Yeah. So kudos. Yeah, it's, it's been life-changing. I mean, when I when people talk to me about running and they're like, oh, I don't know if I could do it. I'm like, but you can. And then wait till you see what else you can do. Like, if you think running is hard, like try being an adult, like try being a, a parent or like having a job or, you know, caring about someone, like that's the hard shit. And once you know you can run and you can push your physical limits, like, everything else in life is just going to come so much easier because like, what do you have to be afraid of? You know? So I guess that explains the quote on your website that says sweat is strong enough to change your life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That is something I firmly, firmly believe in and having the experience that I had and kind of going through that transition myself, it is my mission in life to show other people that same thing. Like you don't have to be an ultra runner. You can go out and run three miles and it can change your life. Um, you just have to, you have to have the right mindset and you have to be willing to get uncomfortable. Well, we wanna to talk to you about the whole eating thing in a bit, but real quick. So going back to the ultra, uh, Nick and I are convinced that we can do it, but it all depends on where we do it. Okay. So let's hear where you did yours. Oof. All right. So the first one that I did was actually an accident, which is very <laughs> on brand for me. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I accidentally ran 50 miles today. I don't know what, what an accident. Yeah. Um, so my, well, my friend Robert and I, it was a nightmare. We, we signed up to do something called, I, where are you guys located also? Like where, where are you at? Nick, you want to go first? I, I'm in Seattle. Okay. Uh, you and I are neighbors. I'm in Jersey. Oh, oh my God. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, I'm sure Seattle is great. It sounds very depressing, but you know, that's cool. Um, <laughs> I go for a run and I'm good. <laughs> all right. That's fine. That's fair. Um, there is an ultra on Long Island called the Pominock Pursuit. It's a, I think it's 74. Um, and so my friend and no, it's not 74. It's 48. I'm sorry. It's 48. So my friend and I were going to split it up. We did a relay team of two, but I got lost in the woods and my GPS cut out and my phone died. And I went five miles in the wrong direction and then had to go five miles back. So I wound up running 32 and that was my first ultra. It was not the intention. All right. Time out. So here's the thing. So Nick, was it Dylan Bowman who also got lost? Yeah. I like, think okay, all you ultra runners also get lost a lot, yeah. which is another reason that we're not really convinced. Yeah. This is exactly. our thing. You're all like nonchalantly, yeah, I accidentally ran six miles the wrong way or whatever. When like, I tell you, I'll never do it again. Like, it, like, a, like a, a trail ultra, never again. It was the worst experience of my life. I was lost in the woods and I was like, this is where I live now. Like, this is it. I'm a, I'm a woods person now. 
I like peed in the woods. I was sitting down eating my sandwich. Like I was just like, this is, this is it. I'm done until the helicopter comes to rescue me. Like this is where I live now. I like how you didn't even ration your sandwich. Like you were only out there for an hour. You're like, yeah. I'm eating the sandwich. The sandwich is gone. I figured like people like me, we don't survive in the woods. Like I was like, I got six hours at most. So let me eat my sandwich and just die in peace. <laughs> it was terrible. So I did that. That was an accidental ultra. And then I did uh, something called the Comset Ultra, which is a, it's like, uh, it's a 5k loop 10 times. So that's on a nice small little paved road and you just go in your circle 10 times. And it's great because I know it sounds like torture, but you have a team at the, like the starting line area. So once every 5k, you get a sandwich, you get some coconut water, you like check in with life, you know, I've, how, what's the score of the game. And then you go on another 5k and it's really not that bad. You just I described actually, a tailgate. You didn't describe a race. Yeah, That's exactly. exactly. Right? Phenomenal. Every college kid right now is like, dude, I bar hop. Yeah. I, yeah. I joke jump from tailgate to tailgate and Fred house too. Like, it's it's exactly like that. It's just a bit of a distance in between. And, you know, you don't get to stop if you feel like you don't want to keep going. Um, it was awesome. It was my favorite. I actually PR'd on my 26.2 split because I was like, if I go a little faster, I get to A, find out the score of the game, and B, have another sandwich. Like, let's go. It was great. So 50, you love 50 sandwiches? sandwiches in Red Bull. Sandwiches in Red Bull. That's, that's how you get through. That's my love language. Yeah, Sour Patch Kids, too. Thank God we brought you on as the eating expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, I'm vegan. I don't do anything. Yeah. Red I'm Bull, vegan. Sour, yeah. sour Patch Kids. It's like, <laughs> exactly. Right. People are often like, oh my God, you how do you run so far? And I'm like, yo, the snacks are <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> like, that's why. Exactly. You well, have to refuel by eating Sour Patch Kids after you go for a long run, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a good Let's continue right there. Let's talk about Nick and I's shitty eating habits and you can critique us. All right, uh, let's do it. Nick, you go first because you're more of a man child. Yeah, I, I mean, I have cereal every morning. I try, I tell myself I'm going to have a smoothie, but I'm too lazy to then actually make it. Um, my, my lunches are like salads and like carrots maybe or potato chips. Because okay. I think I need the fuel and like the salt for if I'm going to go run or bike. And then for dinner, it's whatever my fiance decides. She's she's kind of got that. She's like, do you want to do this? I'm like, yeah, sure. At, whatever. Like, I I know if I were living alone, it'd probably be like a microwavable dinner or, a, you know, a frozen pizza. So this is an upgrade. So, yeah, I I eat what I think as a college kid. Absolutely still a college kid. Okay. So I need help. I need your help right now to tell me what what clean food do I eat to actually see the benefit of all the running, all the biking that I do, walking, all that stuff. Because it, it's like for as much as I work out, you would think that I'd be jacked or have like a six pack. And it's like, no, I just wear size small because I'm a fucking little guy. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, like, I've never been that person that's like, I'm vegan, and you should be too. And here's why, like, I'm just, I'm, I'm really not. Um, but I will say, I, even when it comes to vegan food, like Oreos are vegan, right? Like, you know, some Doritos are vegan, like, let's go, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll dive into that. But like, I feel a tremendous difference in my just like how my body functions like how i recover how long it takes me to you know finish a, a run when i'm like at that you know hit a wall point um just based on whether or not i've been eating processed food or like real food um the difference is tremendous at at my best i can run a marathon on sunday and teach two cycling classes on monday no problem and it's not because I'm magic, like I'm, I'm human garbage. I just eat really well. And like, that's the difference. It's insane. Um, so I always say like, I love a good cheat meal, you know, and I do it once a week, but like my knees don't give a shit if it's Friday afternoon and this is my cheat meal, like tomorrow they are going to be hurting. And like, my back is going to kind of hurt and like, I'm going to be tense in the morning. And so I just always feel like it's just worth it to like, skip the really good stuff unless I'm able to eat it like mid-run in which case it's on so you actually use it for like recovery like I mean so I biked 30 some miles yesterday mm -hmm. feel great you know 
could go run and probably will go run or bike again later today. So I'm kind of like you where it's, you know, I, I obviously will feel that run down feeling when I'm running and be like, okay, I've hit kind of a snag, but I'm pushing myself mentally. And I'm like, bro, come on, don't be a bitch. You know, you got this, like, come on. So I guess when you've experienced with like veganism and, and what you're saying, like right now, does it give you that extra push, you know, to, to finish stronger where I might be not just like going 12 miles per hour, but I might, might finish strong at like 15 or 16. Yeah. I mean, in fairness, I'm sorry, my dogs are psychotic in fairness. <laughs> I, I really was never a runner, not being on a vegan diet. Like, so it's very hard for me to be like, the difference is tremendous. I have very limited experience beforehand, but I know that my entire life is better when I'm fueled properly pre uh, run or race or whatever. And also post. Um, and I, I just like, I mean, my first marathon that I ran, I think I was out of commission for like three or four days afterward. And like the more that I focused on nutrition, the more I was like, I would wake up the next morning and be like, I'm going to work, you know, like I'm going to go, I'm going to go teach a class. No problem. Um, so I, 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 I don't know. I think it makes a tremendous difference. And obviously I'm sure you guys know, like rich roll, if rich roll says something like that's my Bible, like I'm, I'm there for it. And so the more that I kind of started reading about like him and Scott Jurek and all of them, I was like, this is like, this is what I do now. I am, this is the law that I live my life by. So before we get into my eating stuff, I want to just go back and touch on two things. One, Nick self-talks himself by calling himself bro. <laughs> I want that mentioned. Put that on the record, yes. <laughs> You're like, I, bro. I say it out loud and I sing when I'm biking and running and people probably think like I'm a crazy person. That's but fine. Like, but the fact that you're like, bro, don't be <laughs> like that, like, that bro, makes me laugh. Yeah. So that, that's the first thing I want to point out. Second thing I want to point out just from a branding standpoint, Gab, I think you should stick with sweat is like can change your life and not saying I'm human garbage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, Are you sure? You, you called yourself human garbage and I'm like, that's not going to look good on a shirt. I don't think... <laughs> That's yeah. where we want to go with the 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 uh, the branding for uh, Gab Bolin. But so my eating problem is uh, I and I know 100% that I do this because I do it often. I bored eat. Like I'm not hungry. Yeah. I'm bored. Yeah. And one way I've gotten around it, but it makes me look kind of crazy, especially in front of my kids, is uh, I hide food. Mm. So I will take all the food that I know is bad or I know is going to like kind of screw with me or tempt me. And I put it in a bag and I put it in a completely different part of the house that I won't go to habitually to get to it. Yep. So that's my like weird kind of way of doing it. What would you suggest that I should do besides so I don't look like a freak in front of people when they come over and I'm like, oh, you want a snack? Hold on. And I'm getting a bag out of my utility closet that's full of food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um <sighs> What a great like icebreaker though, for one of those parties where people don't all know each other. So maybe, maybe keep doing that. Um, honestly, I, I, so I'm the same way. And one of the hardest things for me about food is like, if I run a race or if I go on like a nice long training run, um, over the last winter, I was training for the keys 100. Um, so I was running more than I've ever run in my entire life. And I could not, like, I was dreaming about Sour Patch Kids. I couldn't, I couldn't just keep it to like during the training. It was so hard to like break that habit of, you know, even like drinking soda and stuff like that. It was like, I need it. Like I need it all the time. And so I will snack or like board eat on things like carrots and cucumbers that I don't actually really want. So that eventually I'm like, I'd rather just not eat this because it's not really satisfying that like craving that I have for something salty or sweet or processed or whatever. Um, and it's one of those things that like, it just, it takes a few days of like really sticking to it so that eventually you don't have those cravings anymore. But it's like, it's so ironic how we can go out and run for 18 miles and we're like well I said I was gonna do it so I'm gonna do it but when it comes to not eating potato chips we're like gripped by this horrible like we can't tear ourselves away from it um so I mean there there are worse things that you could be struggling with I guess well one thing I mean the food is genetically modified to make you want to rip into it so we're kind of like battling chemicals and 
and things it's like an uphill that. battle yeah yeah but uh one of the things you touched on that i don't think we've ever talked about before so um your reward when you're done with all of the running or whatever you're doing is sour patch kids and then you find yourself wanting sour patch kids when you're not running and doing other stuff do you feel like maybe it's your mind connecting sour patch kids to i accomplished something really big and it's kind of like like a, pa a pavlov's dog kind of thing like i did something great my reward for that is sour patch kids therefore in this moment i want sour patch kids because that means i did something good i have never and probably would have never put those two things together but i think you're absolutely right cool i'm 100%. done this is a great thing i'm done i'm good <laughs> You like, where is the book? Like, get it, get it yeah. written down. Somebody that written me is off right now. <laughs> amazing. Uh, probably, yeah. And honestly, like, I, I also, I eat them while I'm running. Like, once I'm going above 12 or 13, I'm taking them with me and putting them in my pocket. So I also think that while I'm doing something challenging, I'm like, you know what would really make me feel better? Like, so if I'm doing something stressful or if I'm having like a, you know, a difficult day at work or, or dealing with a problem with a coworker, I'm like, I really need Sour Patch Kids right now to get me through this. So interesting, wow. Thank you for just, I mean, why do I have a therapist? Like, I just, I'm just going to talk to you when I have something weird going on. Chris is a good internet therapist. I will give him that. I, I refer to myself as bro. I'm an internet bro. He is an internet therapist. So one, if you have any problems, hit one, him up. One time I diagnosed Nick because he wasn't like doing his, his runs were shitty. He went to biking, his biking was shitty. And he was like, oh, I'm just having all these problems. And I drilled it down to, his fiance was gone for like three months and living in another country. And I'm like, dude, you're depressed because your fiance is gone. He was like, oh my God, like I didn't even think of that. Like maybe we should start a second, like we couch this where I just talk to people about their issues. I, right? I, oh my God, I fully support that. And I also request to be the first guest. Sure. Like, yeah. let's do it. Totally. I'll sit you down on the couch. I'll bring you some Sour Patch Kids and I'll be like, let's talk about all your, your inner child. And, and underneath the couch cushions that you're laying down on will be the potato chips and beef jerky that Chris hid from his kids when he's born snack or it's, you know, he's born and snacks. Yes. Inside of the cushions. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Bags on top yeah. of bags. Kids are like, oh, dad, can I have something? And I have to go into the utility closet above my toolbox. And they're like, uh, all right. Like, I think they think I'm hiding it from them. Right. Right. But which, which I'm not. No. So. Uh, Nick. Oh, no, I thought you were going to say, uh, okay. I, thought you were gonna say I, I thought you wanted to go. So um, we got into the eating thing. So real quick, what, what would you, uh, what's some advice you'd give to people who, so right now we're in the beginning of January, everyone's trying to get back on their, you know, resolutions, but we're probably still continuing the eating like crap that we did all through the holidays. So like, what's the first move that people should do besides hide their food? Damn, that was what I was going to say. It's so genius. <laughs> um, I honestly think that if three quarters of the time, right, 75% of the time, if you can switch something processed for an unprocessed version, and that doesn't necessarily mean like a healthy version, literally just something that hasn't been altered and add, you know, had it add, have added sugar and salt and all that stuff added into it, um, you're going to be better off. So if what you're really craving is potato chips, can you take a potato and slice it up and put it in the oven and put some salt on it and then, you know, eat the homemade potato chips so that at least they're not the ones that are, you know, being processed by Lay's and they're, they're laden with all this garbage, like make your garbage and then enjoy it. And even just that little difference is going to really, really, uh, just add up over time. So make your garbage and don't be human waste, human trash. What was it? Was it, human, it was human garbage. Human garbage. Human garbage. Okay. That's the I first time it. I've ever heard of myself that way. Now I feel garbage. the branding. Now I feel the branding. The branding is garbage. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Ga so, Gab's garbage. <laughs> Gab's garbage. <laughs> are, are you, so are you of the, the thought process that you just don't buy it, keep it out of the house and you won't have that temptation? Um, yes and no. So I am personally, um, I am, I, I consider myself more plant-based. Like I want to have the, the fruits and the vegetables and the whole grains and like the other stuff, like I know I'm going to eat it if it's there. So I don't want it. However, 
I am married to a junk food vegan. He is also vegan. We went vegan together. His health has improved so much. He lost like 70 pounds or something crazy like that. He was pre-diabetic. Now he's not. He like works out occasionally, um, not like a crazy runner or anything like that. Um, but he is a junk food vegan and all he eats is like the garbage. And so it's constantly in my house and I have to have that same battle of like, Ugh. Hold up, hold up. 70 pounds. Yeah, 70 pounds. Yeah. Over, over how long? Um, I think it was 40 pounds in three months and then 70 pounds throughout a full calendar year. God damn. Yeah. Good for yeah. him. Like, yeah, some kudos. We're talking like Oreos, like Beyond Meat, like not like fruits and vegetables only. I'm talking like just not consuming dairy and meat anymore. And like it just, it, it just happened. All right, so I'm fascinated by this. We got, <laughs> we got. Well, uh, so you're an incredibly fit person who, you know, that's your life. And I, I'm not, I'm not saying that he maybe was not fit, but if you have 70 pounds to spare, you're kind of out. So how did like, did you kind of encourage him? Did you let him go? Were you like, this is just the way he is? Like, how did? So when I first met him, he was a big runner, and I was not. And he, we lived in the city and he would be like, oh, like, let's go for a run through Central Park. And I was like, I would rather be dead. Like, no, I'm not going for a run with you through Central Park. Absolutely not. Um, but he convinced me and we would do it a little bit from time to time, but he was kind of the one who was, who was much more fit. And then eventually he got a job in corporate America and he was sitting on his butt all the time. And because he's always been like a big snacker and big into junk food, it just kind of got a little bit out of control. And he at one point was like, I really want to make a change, but I don't think I could be vegan. Um, I had just started for athletic purposes. I was running a little bit more. So when I ran my first half marathon, he ran it with me. Um, and he was actually watching something at one point, very, very early on. I had been vegan for maybe like two or three weeks and he's a big animal lover. And they were like, what's the difference between this pig and your dog? And for whatever reason, I love animals, but that was not my MO when I went vegan, but that just really spoke to him. And he was like, oh my God, I need to stop. And so he just switched his diet. He went vegetarian first and then he went vegan. And all of that extra weight that he had put on from just kind of being very sedentary all the time, it just fell off. But he was still kind of sedentary. He was just not eating that much garbage anymore it was like different garbage it just whatever went on in his body it was just much happier i i honestly wish i even had like a better answer mm -hmm. that's incredible yeah kudos yeah. to him that is that's awesome like beyond awesome so has he you said he's not necessarily a big you know fitness guy now but is he still running when he has time is he taking class is are, are you guys doing things together like what what is he doing to maintain other than just his diet. Yeah. So he, he, I'm going to turn the light on if you don't mind, just cause I, sure. I see myself getting really, really dark. Yeah. Go for it. He, um, there we go. Now I'm yellow. He, go. um, he, he's, he loves to run. He's never run a marathon 13. I think 13.1 is the furthest he's ever gone. Um, but he really, really enjoys it. I think he was a sprinter in high school. So the distance thing is a little bit like overwhelming. Um, he, will run when he has the time to. So like during quarantine, when he was working from home all the time, he ran more than I've ever seen him run. And he looked amazing. Like he was really killing it. And then work kind of like came back to normal and he still worked from home, but he's doing a little bit less uh, running and like the work is a little bit more intensive. So he's not running as much. Um, and then obviously like, you know, it's so hard to get back into it and whatever. So he's definitely always been active. Um, it's just a, a different lifestyle. And I often have to remind myself that like, if I had a desk job all day, I don't know that I would be capable of doing what I'm doing either. Um, he loves to cycle. So when I was teaching in-person classes, he would come and take my class all the time. Um, he's really, really into movement. I think it's just a matter of, it's not it's not as much of a passion for him in the way that it is for people like us. And so it's hard to kind of be like, well, just get up at four o'clock in the morning and go for a run. And it's like, for us, it's like, if that's what we have to do, that's what we have to do. And for him, it's like, that's not an option, you know? Let's talk about real quick for the, so I'm sure there's some people out there who listen, who, you know, we have people who listen who are very active. They might have a spouse or a partner who is not active. 
Now you're a personal trainer and you had, you have a husband who was active, but like not as much. How do you kind of keep Gab, the personal trainer away from like the relationship and like for people out there, how can they kind of gently motivate their spouse who maybe isn't as um, motivated to work out? Yeah, it's tough. And honestly, like, because it is my job and because it is my career and it's like very, you know, it's, it's tremendously important to me. I often have that conversation with him where I'm like, I know you want to sit at home and order a pizza, but like, if you do, I'm going to eat it. I I don't have that kind of self-control. And like, I can't, like, I have to, you know, even when it's like a physical thing, like I have to teach a class at six o'clock in the morning. I can't be nauseous because I had, you know, three slices of pizza the night before. Um, So we do have those conversations where it's, it's not even like, oh, I don't want to eat that. It's like, I physically can't. Um, But I think that it's important to, just like with anything to be able to separate like what you want from what somebody else might want. Um, and it took me a long time to understand that like, I wanted to run ultras and he didn't, and nothing that I was going to say was going to convince him to do it because he just didn't want to. And what actually wound up happening was he fell in love. Well, I don't know if I would say fell in love, but he started to really enjoy the process of being um, a teammate for me and like being at the race course and having the sandwiches ready and the, you know, kind of knowing what I needed nutritionally before I needed it. And, you know, keeping track on Instagram and show everybody where I was and what was going on. And, you know, we call him like the logistics specialist um, because he was, he was really doing so much on the back end to kind of make sure that I was good. And so we kind of developed like a really cool system that way that we both enjoyed. Um, I wouldn't rather not go and watch someone on the sidelines and hand them sandwiches. I think that sounds boring, but for whatever reason, like he enjoys it, you know? Um, And then we were able to find a few things that we both really enjoyed that we could do together. And it wasn't anything extreme. You know, we weren't talking about like running, you know, 30 miles together. Um, but he really enjoyed running over quarantine with me for like six or seven miles. So we would go out and do that. Um, he really enjoys taking my cycling classes. So we do that kind of stuff together. Um, we love to hike. So it was kind of just like a give and take of what can we both enjoy where one of us isn't entirely suffering the whole time. Great advice. I love it. Nick, that's for you. So you don't push your fiance to do shit that she doesn't want to do. Trust me. I'm literally taking notes mentally being like, gosh, I I need to make sure that I stick to that plan because there are a lot of times where I'm like, come bike, come do this. And she's like, my little legs can't keep up with yours, dude. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, so go ahead, Nick. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I know you're going to ask because you're probably going to ask. I'm not probably going to ask the same same thing. So go ahead. No, no, go. It's you. It is you. Okay. Gab, uh, when everything opens up and the world goes back to normal, what are you training for? <sighs> this is the hardest question ever because I was training for the Keys 100 and then it got canceled. And I think about it every single day of my life. I would love to do that race. Um, but having trained for the entire race and having it canceled like six weeks before, once you know what it feels like to train to run a hundred miles, like, I don't know that I could put myself through that again. And knowing, like, I know myself well enough to know that I will um, at some point, but right now, because of my teaching schedule, I don't know that I really have the physical capability to do all of that and then also train for a hundred mile ultra. Um, So with that kind of on the back burner, I need to do another marathon again, just to do it. I've often thought about just going out and running 26.2, but I don't know, like, I don't know, is anybody going to hand me a beer afterward? Like, is it worth it if you don't, you know, where are the Sour Patch Kids going to be? I was just going to say, just have Sour Patch Kids, literally like your husband's there every six miles to hand you a small little bag that you can just chow on and you're, you should be good. I I have faith that you'll be all right that way. That's honestly probably the the way that it will go down if it does go down. Um, But I've also thought about starting with like a half iron and kind of seeing how that goes and then potentially training for a full if I think I have it in me. Have you ever considered like a Spartan or a Tough Mudder or any of those types of things? I've done a few of those. Um, 
I like them. I think that there's a, a level of seriousness that you kind of develop as like a, a runner um, where when you go to one of those races, it's like kind of frustrating. It's fun, but it's like, it doesn't like, it doesn't feel like a real race, you know, um, challenging as hell, but I'm like, I don't know. I think uh, I just pissed a lot of people off. I think I, th it's I think what you're nicely trying to say is it's for people who internally call themselves bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a type of person. Um, no, they're fun. They're fun as fuck and they're hard. Um, maybe it's like the stop and go aspect where I'm kind of just like, oh my God, can we like, can we, can we like move please? Or the team aspect. I'm not a great team player, you know, like I, uh, I really, really, really like to move at my own pace, whether it's fast or slow today, I don't know, but like if there's somebody else and they're going faster or slower, like I can't. Fair enough, fair enough. Gab, where can we find you, you know, get more information on you, whether it's website, social, all that good stuff. Yeah, so my website is gabriellebolin.com. Uh, my Instagram is at gab.bolin. And uh, if you use Facebook, if you have like great nieces and nephews and you're a Facebook user, um, I'm on there as Gabrielle Bolin. So you can find me uh, on all three. I think you awesome. mean, I think you mean like if you have grandparents who use Facebook. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I was yeah. like, grand nieces and nephews. <laughs> I always say that <laughs> Facebook is how I keep in touch with my great aunts. Yes, yes, exactly. it's how, yeah. It's, it's how you announce things to the older generation who uh, yeah. will never read Instagram or anything like that. Right. So if you have a 62 year old father looking to get into running. Uh, yeah. Follow yep, her send him to my Facebook. <laughs> that, that's it. Exactly. You, you like one Facebook page and it's Sour Patch Kids and that's it. Exactly, <laughs> yep. And I get all the necessary information that way. Cool. Well, awesome. Gab, thanks a lot. We loved having you on. Thank you guys so much for having me. That was awesome. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Thanks. And that brings another episode of We Run This to a Close. Nick and I want to thank everybody for listening. If you love the podcast, please share it with friends or leave a review on iTunes. And remember to follow Nick and I on social media. He's at It's Nick Domingo and I'm at Chris Luminati on Twitter. Or follow us both on Instagram at We Run This underscore pod. Until next time, see everybody out there.